Okay, so you've heard me talk on the podcast many times about the potential of making your own living biofertilizers. And we're going to teach you some of the principles of brewing microbes here uh, in this little how to do it segment today. Uh, we're going to brew, we're at a Collins farm, uh, and we're going to brew 500 litres of one of our products, one of my favourite products called Microforce. Now Microforce, I'll just show you what it is. It's a freeze-dried, it's made by a UK company for us. It's a freeze-dried powder, so it's very, very stable. It will last for decades, in effect, until you put water with it. Um, and it consists of five of the most researched of beneficial bacteria. They're all bacillus strains, which are, of course, the most hardy of the soil life in terms of um, bacteria. They're very, very hardy. They can handle, you know, even chemically stressed soils. They can handle heat. They're kind of perfect for the brave new world of climate change farming. They can handle dry, they can handle high salt and so forth. But the organisms we're talking about, you would have heard of some of them perhaps. You might have heard of Bacillus subtilis, which is multi-researched in terms of its capacity to control mildew diseases while also stimulating plant growth via the release of three biochemicals that stimulate plant immunity. And the exciting thing about immune elicitors, without exception, every one of them boosts yield as well. So there's a fertilizing response from that organism. There's a second organism that's really kind of become the poster boy or girl or whatever of, uh, of, of inoculums currently. It's called, big name, Bacillus amyloliquefaciens. They used to think it was one of the Bacillus uh, subtilis strains, but it's not. It's its own strain they've discovered. And the research is, I mean, Google it for yourself. The research is mind boggling in terms of disease control, plant growth stimulation. And interestingly, all five of the bacillus organisms don't just boost immunity and stimulate root growth and leaf growth and so forth. Um, they also fix nitrogen, all five of them. All five of them solubilize locked up phosphorus, and there's no shortage of that in most soils. And all five of them produce copious amounts of an enzyme called chitinase. And why that's exciting is because Chitin is the second most abundant biopolymer. Now, what's a biopolymer? Well, chlorophyll is the most abundant. It's everywhere. We're looking at a sea of chlorophyll. But second uh, is this material called chitin. And why it's so abundant is because fungi, which are the most dominant in terms of biomass of all the soil life, their outer cell wall is made of chitin. The insects, which are the most dominant of all life forms, 75% of all life on the planet is insects, their outer shell is made of chitin, uh, and in the inner wall of caterpillars, their gut wall, is made of chitin. So chitinase, anything with an A's on the end as an enzyme, digests chitin. And herein we see this associated insecticidal and fungicidal effect that you can get with this do-it-yourself living fertilizer. It really is something special. So let's talk about how we brew. We'll talk about some of the principles of brewing microbes. Anything, not necessarily a task-specific blend like this that fixes nitrogen and does all these other jobs that we just talked about, but you know, making a compost tea doing, which is more of a broad spectrum kind of concept where you're bringing in maximum biodiversity, whereas this is specialist organisms doing specialist jobs. But in all instances, there are some rules. And the starting point for brewing microbes, and this is really important, is that hygiene is absolutely critical. We need to clean our tank. If we're using dam water or even tank water. I mean, tank water, everyone says, oh, I'm healthy, I'm drinking my tank water. Yeah, but the birds pooed and the possums pooed and you've got compost sludge in the guttering. And when you analyze and you send it off for tests, very commonly it says not fit for drinking. So tank water is not necessarily clean from a microbial perspective. Uh, and, and dam water is even worse. So what we do is clear the decks. And you might use, we have a product called PathX, which can be used for that purpose. Or you might just use pool chlorine, which is cheap as chips, at label rates. But the issue is that it needs to be out of the water before you begin brewing. So I like to leave it for a whole night. So the night before, we'll turn on the pump uh, and we'll put in the, 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 the appropriate rate of chlorine and we bubble it off. And people say, oh, that takes an hour. No, it takes more than an hour, much more than an hour. And overnight is the safe thing. You must smell the water with the bubbles and there should be zero chlorine smell. And certainly 12 hours takes care of that. So you've cleared the deck and now you can add your microbes into the equation. Now, there are a few other things. We're trying to create ideal conditions to maximize the brew brewing, the multiplication of these, of these organisms. One of those issues is temperature. Now, they'll, they'll still operate in other than ideal temperature rates, but for these bacillus blends, for example, and most bacterial blends, it's about 30 degrees. So in winter, it can be an issue. 
uh, in winter, you can actually buy little wrap around silicon blankets that will warm up the water for you. Even if you start your water with some hot water, uh, the microbes, once they start moving, they will generate some of their own heat as they're multiplying every 20 minutes, which is their replication rate. Uh, so it's quite important, that sort of 30 degree. If you're brewing a fungal dominated compost tea, it's cooler, it's more like sort of 20 degrees is sufficient and protozoa is more like 25 to 30. So bacteria are the warmest, uh, and that 30 degree mark, if you can get there, will optimize the brewing of those, of those organisms. Now, from a pH perspective, the pH of the water needs to be sort of seven, seven, so neutral for bacteria, and that we're brewing bacteria in this instance, seven, 7.5. A fungi, we wanna have it more acidic. In fact, the ideal pH for fungi is 4.7, and why it's ideal is because bacteria can't multiply very well at 4.7. So fungi who breed much more slowly have a chance to proliferate when you shut down the bacteria with a lower pH with 4. And we have a product called Dominate Fungi, which is doing exactly that, dropping the pH down to 4.7, stabilizing that pH drop uh, to allow the fungi to prosper and the bacteria to slow right down. So that's just a way to get fungal domination in a tea. But in this case, we're not worried about fungal, we're worried about these very, very effective of bacteria. So we'll continue now and show you how we would brew. Uh, in this case, 500 litres is what Colin's asked for for his farm. So 250 grams, that's 50 grams per 100 litres of these freeze dried powder. So we're going to add the 250 grams into this tank before we activate the pump. So the other components that we mentioned, there's a product called liquid microbe food or LMF, which is basically a conglomeration of ideal foods for bacteria specifically. Well, actually, it's, there's actually some fungal foods in there as well, but there's dominated by bacterial foods. There's a whole range of, of stimulants and trace minerals and amino acids and humates and so forth in there. So we're gonna add that at the rate of one litre per 100 litres, so five litres five litres of liquid micro food, or LMF we call it. We can see the drum down here, LMF. Okay. And then we uh, also add a product called Dominate B. Uh, and Dominate B is basically optimising bacterial growth, but it has a secondary effect that normally when you brew a living blend like this, um, it's not that user friendly in the sense that you really got to put it out as soon as you finish the 24 hour brewing process, as fast as you can get it out there the better, but if you use this Dominate B additive, it sort of stabilizes it, it gives you at least a week, up to 10 days in which you can get it out there. So it, it makes it much more user friendly in t terms of finding the time to put it out. But always, if you can, you brew it, you put it out, there's a rule of thumb. So that's our three ingredients. Um, and we're now ready to brew. So we'll turn on our pump and it's a 24 hour process. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna bubble this, this the story of, 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 of Brewing microbes, there's lots and lots of tiny bubbles. That's the essence of it. We want to have as many tiny bubbles as possible. And that tiny bubble gives the greatest surface area because you're trying to achieve good levels of something called dissolved oxygen. Now the story with dissolved oxygen is that you can buy a meter. If you're trying to set up your own do-it-yourself brewing station and it hasn't been sort of commercially tested, then beg, borrow, or steal a dissolved oxygen meter because you need to know that you can maintain a minimum of six parts per million of dissolved oxygen throughout that 24 hour process. Because understand if you're putting in a few billion organisms as we've done in this freeze dried form and they're now activated and they start multiplying every 20 minutes, well, you know, 10 billion becomes 20 million, 20 minutes later, 40, 80, 160, 320, and we're only an hour and a half in. Uh, you've got trillions of organisms, 12 hours in, and if you can't provide enough of this dissolved oxygen by hundreds, thousands of tiny bubbles, then you, you don't know it, you've just got this dirty water, but they're all dead. They suffocated in the absence of sufficient oxygen. So it's really important to know that your system, your brewing system can deliver throughout, no matter how much pressure, how many organisms have multiplied, that you can maintain six to eight parts per million of dissolved oxygen throughout to know that you've been successful. So a dissolved oxygen meter is invaluable in that context. So we're ready to go. We can turn on the meter and we'll perhaps show you what it looks like inside there. So we're using, there's various ways that you can brew microbes. You can use an aerated system with a, a pipe network with tiny little holes that will deliver, usually one, one and a half mil holes that will deliver thousands of those tiny little bubbles with an air pump, an external air pump. Or you can use a pump with a venturi and a couple of pipes that are sucking in air. You can stop it. 
stop it basically if you close the pipe because you're not sucking in air anymore. Uh, and that air is then pumped out into each corner of a square pump, a square tank, so that you've got aeration throughout the tank. So the little aerator system squirting out of those tiny bubbles in four directions into each corner and creating this really good coverage of tiny bubbles throughout the tank. So there's two ways that you can do it, and this is as good as any, and it's what we use in this 1,000-litre uh, brewery. And it's called the 1,000-litre brew style, this setup, uh, and it's, you know, it's a great way to make your own cheap living fertiliser. So if we wanted to have a look in here, we'll do that next. Okay, thanks for listening. To